This evening's presentation by Raphael Lozano Hemmer was generously supported by Miriam Rowland. Miriam, your support of this speaker series so far and into the future is deeply appreciated by students and faculty here in the department and by the wider Montreal arts community. Thank you. I'd also like to thank David Howes and CISC, the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Society and Culture, uh, for their support of this special presentation. Raphael is a Mexican-Canadian media artist, recently the subject of solo exhibitions at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Fondation Telefonica in Madrid, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney. He was the first artist to officially represent Mexico at the Venice Biennale in 2007. He is also shown at Biennales in Havana, Istanbul, Kochi, Liverpool, Montreal, Moscow, New Orleans, Seoul, Seville, Shanghai, Singapore, and Sydney. I've been everywhere, man. I've been <laughs> everywhere. His work is in collections such as the MoMA in New York, Hirshhorn in Washington, D.C., and MUAC in Mexico, Mexico, and Tate in London. We are thrilled to have Raphael here with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you so much, Tamar. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Great. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Concordia and uh, sponsors and everybody who uh, brought me here today. Um, prior to coming, uh, at, in the Facebook page, I made a poll um, asking uh, people who would join, join us today for the talk to choose either between making a presentation that only covers recent work, so like the past three years worth of production, or if I do something that's more like a, a, a presentation that is more panoramic, that is like a, like a, a projects classified by recurrent themes. So there's themes that I return to all the time. Um, and I ask people to vote. But I gave a third option, which is to present a DJ set um, with <laughs> cumbia music and tropical drinks, and that one. Um, so, you know, tonight, uh, you're supposed to be bringing the drinks, so, and I don't see anybody with coolers. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so, but apart from the fact that 30 voted for the DJ set, recurrent uh, set, ten, 10 of them voted for recurrent, and only recent work won. So then I prepared a, a talk that is basically a run through of about 23 years of work, lots of little video clips with uh, quite a lot of variety. Um, and then the idea is that after the presentation of those things, we can open it up for a discussion, which is uh, usually what's, what's most fun. Um, I should uh, say before I start that um, I work in a team, a team of people, and it's really exciting for me to give a talk here in Montreal where the studio is based because with us today, for instance, we have Karin and Nico and Carolina and Marc and, uh, well, Stefan's wife. Um, <laughs> and uh, these are the people with whom I collaborate to make the work. So you will see that as I present the works, I often speak about we, you know, because it's, uh, it's a production that is no longer the artist with some kind of, you know, sort of existential drama in front of a canvas. Um, it's rather more like a theater uh, production where, you know, I, I sort of direct people who have different talents, and so I'm indebted to, to them, and I'm really happy that they're here today. Also, I see some friends, which is exciting. Hopefully, we can drink after. Um, I should say that <clears throat> I've been working in 25 years in the field of media art, um, and from the very early sort of uh, stages of that, I've rejected the term new media, and uh, it's a term that I find is very disingenuous and uh, naive. Um, as you know, media art is a tradition. It's a tradition of experimentation that is hundreds of years old. That's how I see it. And I don't mean um, just interactivity, but in general, like experimentation with with electrical currents, with electronics, with kinematics, with optics, with all of these different things. And so what I'll do is as I present the work today, I'll try and make some references to those inspiring precedents because it's a really important thing that we see uh, work in media art as fully integrated into those traditions of experimentation. So as a, <coughs> sorry, as a anecdote just before we start is um, recently, well, a few years back we did a show in Paris, and uh, it featured 12 artworks with visual with cameras. 
surveillance cameras that follow the public. And people were saying, oh, this new media thing and so on. And I said, listen, you know, in 1965, Marta Minujín, an Argentinian artist, uh, in her work La Menesunda, used um, live cameras trained on the public uh, as part of her installation. Mm -hmm. And this is important for two reasons. One of them is because she's the pioneer of live video in uh, installation. So four months before Nam Jung Paik ever got a porta pack, this woman was already doing this kind of live broadcast in her artwork in Buenos Aires. But the second reason it's important is because uh, so, sorry, the first reason is important because we break stereotypes about what Latin American art is, right? So we have Frida Kahlo, which is really nice, but at the same time we have the nerd team. Um, and, uh, and then the second reason that's important is because that was 48 years ago. So to turn around and pretend 48 years later that this is something new is, as I said, is just lazy and un uninformed. So, let's uh, begin. Um, with uh, the presentation of recurrent themes. We'll start with distributed. The, the bulk of my work has taken place in public space. So I've done large scale interactive installations to try and activate uh, a public space, usually by creating installations that are performative, they're interactive, there's uh, ways for people to participate in them. And the important thing with this is to try to be away from the language of Sans et Lumière, the, the language even of fireworks display, this idea of cathartic spectacle. And so um, I got invited in 1999 to transform the Zócalo Square in Mexico City. And uh, if you know Mexico City, <clears throat> you have here the buildings around it. To the right at the time was the PRI building, which is the national government, so center left. On the bottom, you had the municipal government buildings, which is the PRD, so the left. On the top, you have the cathedral, so the PAN, the right wing. And then the fourth wall was uh, jewelry shops and hotels, so the money. And underneath, you had like Tenochtitlan, the, the Aztec um, sort of ruins. <clears throat> and on top of it, you fit uh, 320,000 people. Um, it's well known that Mexico City features the most uh, protests a year. It's a thousand protests a year uh, are staged in this plaza. So at any given day, you might find like 3,000 pharmacists and 2,000 taxi drivers and whatever. And the scale of the plaza is so big that it completely overwhelms and, and subsumes any kind of individual protest. So given that context, uh, the only place that I thought it was possible to make a takeover for a big installation was the sky. So we studied the use of uh, powerful searchlights to um, activate the sky. On the top left, you have in the Paris World Expo at the end of the 19th century, these beacons of light were really the, the signal of the arrival of modernity, the idea that this new um, energy, electricity, which could be visualized and could transform the city. Then the top right, you have Albert Speer's um, Nuremberg rallies, this idea of using those lights, which typically were now being used for anti-aircraft surveillance, for spectacles of power and intimidation, with the message, we are big, you are small. Then after the Second World War, the searchlights were used for victory parades. And today, we associate the movement of these searchlights very similar to, you know, we have Times Square there, but to the opening of a new shopping mall or discotheque. And then the most problematic of them all is the bottom right is uh, Jean-Michel Jarre's $56 million extravaganza at the Pyramids of Egypt in 1999, where this neo-colonial project of bringing in a French guy who, with his vision, will show the Egyptians how rich their culture is. And uh, you, can feel, you can feel a little bit of, my, of, my, of the envy that I have for his budget, but at the same time, a, a real contempt for uh, the way in which these technologies are often used to try and highlight very specific aspects of, of a culture. And so it, it, very much a lot of these technologies are used in what Edward Said would call an identitarian way. It's like how to reaffirm those, those, uh, those winners. Uh, Bertolt Brecht famously once said, you know, that Great Rome was built, uh, was filled with arches of triumph. And Brecht asked, who built them? Over whom did the Caesars triumph? So the possibility to make interventions in public space that don't animate to reaffirm those power structures is a challenge. I'm, I'm not saying I, fig I, I figured it out, but, but it's a concern. So what I proposed, oh, I have to stop my cumbia, I'm sorry. 
This is it. All right, so that's the cumbia, and now we go back to this. So Measuring. my proposal um, was to place uh, 18 of the most powerful robotic searchlights in the rooftops surrounding the buildings of the Socalo and measure them with GPS trackers um, to know the three-dimensional location of each one of the searchlights. And then we created a website, alzado.net, where you could, with Java, um, direct each one of those lights and create light sculptures. There were formations, meshes, sculptures, uh, and then you could preview them by actually sort of navigating through the, through the interface and seeing your design before you sent it to Mexico. The idea with this is that once you were happy with your design, once you've made uh, some kind of formation, you would uh, put your name, uh, your location, maybe a dedication, and then you would send it to Mexico City. And every night for two weeks, between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., the lights on the square would actually perform um, the movements that the Internet uh, participants would send. So this scene here, for instance, is at 3 in the morning on a Tuesday. There's very few people in the square. But those lights are moving as there is uh, traffic on the Internet. Now, in Mexico, we have uh, beautiful pollution. So it works like a natural hazer, like a fog fluid. So you see the nice, nice and bright. Um, the, the, the concept of this project then, it's not so much to create a show that follows a pre-established narrative or a score, but rather that if someone sends their own participation, that that's what will uh, be rendered in the sky. And in terms of being an artist of this kind of work, it's humbling because if no one participates, the light's actually turned off. Now this is at 8 uh, p.m. on a Thursday night, and so people are just hanging out. And some of the things that are important about uh, the work being distributed, it doesn't just mean the fact that um, you could uh, participate from anywhere in Mexico City or the world. It also means that the work itself doesn't have a proscenium. It doesn't have a VIP vantage point. Right here, you're seeing it from, uh, from these cameras, and it's actually covering all of your peripheral vision. So the idea that it, the piece doesn't have a beginning or an end or some cathartic uh, crescendo. And you notice how when the displays, when the lights stop um, for a brief moment um, in between designs, what we would do during those moments is we would photograph the design of each participant with these webcams, and we would build a personalized web page for each and every participant. On the left, here's some example web pages. On the left, you have um, shots that as you were designing in your school or home or work. And on the right, the actual photographs to show you that your design actually did take place. And this was really important in 1999 because in Mexico, we'd been voting against the PRI for 80 years and nothing had happened. So the possibility that people could see through this feedback that participation was a way to tra for transformation was an important kind of message. And on the top right of each page, you have these comments, which were completely uncensored, which is a really difficult thing to negotiate back then. If you remember 1999, well, you don't because many of you are very young, but the Zapatista rebellion was very active electronically. And so there was this concern about, well, what will people say? And yet what most people said were things like, I'll dedicate this design to Margarita, who's at the hospital. I hope you feel better. There was football scores, poems. There was uh, 27 marriage proposals, things like that. And the possibility for this space, this, this plaza, to be personalized is what we were looking for. So, 
Um, and so through word of mouth, but also through media coverage, people would find out that if those lights were moving is because someone was participating. The response was really um, incredible. Uh, we got 800,000 participants. That's 800,000 different IP addresses over a period of two weeks. Um, and, uh, and so the project was always uh, fully saturated. And this is the kind of thing that is really possible in, in, in an internet medium where there's a lot of disintermediation, right? Like uh, if all of a sudden the project becomes viral, a lot of people show up and begin participating. Um, this is the very same project, Victorial Elevation, but this time I'm showing it in the uh, Place Belcourt. This is in Lyon as part of the Fête de Lumière. And the thing that I'm most interested in achieving is what you see down there, the people just walking around without shopping. So I think that it's a, a really nice <laughs> challenge to think about how to reactivate public space without corporate or consumer sort of uh, tasks. Um, I am passionate about the art's lack of utility um, and for people to just sort of hang out in the space is something that I'm uh, very interested in doing. And in subsequent versions of the project, we've, you know, we've made the, the, the cities, you know, sort of in 3D and so on and so forth. And consistently, we've been getting very good traffic. But as time goes by, w better tools come out. So the latest version of this project was made in Vancouver uh, for, the, for the Olympics. And for that version, we used Google Maps and uh, Google Earth. Um, and one of the beautiful things about Google Earth is that already there were, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of buildings uh, built in 3D. And so we didn't have to render the city. We could leverage um, the, the, the existing kind of crowdsourced database uh, that, that, that there was outside of English Bay. And so when we did in this project in Vancouver, I'll tell you a funny anecdote, is um, we used 240,000 watts of power. And uh, I told the Olympic Committee that we needed to talk about power because, you know, I, I just like anybody else, I, I, I care about the environment. And I thought that it was important to talk about, well, what, how to understand this amount of power. And they said, no, 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 let's not talk about that. And uh, of course, the very first thing that somebody in the CBC said is that my piece was environmental September 11th uh, because we were using so much power. And then I quickly you know, had to do some, um, what do you say in English, uh, spin doctoring. And so I went on, on, on the TV and said, well, you know, yeah, it is a lot of power. It's also a tenth what a typical hockey game uses. And then everybody's like, oh, no, no, don't touch our hockey. And I was like, it's good, it's good. You go and use some power. Um, <laughs> But it's, 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 yeah, so these are temporary installations in Vancouver. It was up for a month. Uh, we also got 500,000 participants, so it was, it was quite fun. And um, in Vancouver, this is just a, uh, uh, what do you call this thing? Uh, a time-lapse uh, fo photo just at, outside of English Bay. So that's uh, Victorial Elevation. After I made this work, I became the searchlight artist. And that's something that you really don't want to be. Um, the, the, you know, anyway, I'll show you what the alternative was. So distributed, no VIP, no proscenium. There's multiple entry points into the work. Out of control. So a key thing in most interactive pieces, especially if they're in public space, is that I cannot once they're uh, presented, control how people will behave. And that's key, right? Because that is, let, let's be utopian and call it the democratic potential of one of these works, is the capability for people to feel self-represented. There's nobody telling you what to do or not to do. And contrary to a project like Vectorial, where you have to learn how to control the interface and so on and so forth, I needed some way to actually have a much more intuitive participation. So inspired by this engraving um, from, uh, from uh, the 17th century, is Samuel von Hochstraten. It's an engraving. Um, von Hochstraten was a disciple of Rembrandt, who, like Rembrandt, used shadow plays to uh, teach perspective. Um, but the thing that this particular engraving was exciting for me is that the very um, sort of large shadows were monstrous and demonic, and the tiny ones are, were angelical and pure. And so this idea of the monstrosity of the Colossus is, is, uh, is, is something that inspired this work. The engraving was made in Rotterdam, the city that commissioned the work that I'm about to show you. So what we did 
is for Cultural Capital of Europe. This is in 2001. We did a, a project, a portraiture project, uh, featuring um, uh, 1,200 square meters of interactive uh, projections. So what we did is we photographed people from Rotterdam and we projected them 27 meters high onto this facade. And then we put two other projectors on the ground, which were so powerful that they would wash out all of the, all of the portraiture. As people walked in the plaza, they would cast their shadow onto the building. And as they walked close to or far away from the facade, their shadow would grow from two meters all the way to 27 meters. And so a game of representation ensued where people would um, sort of start reorganizing in the public space to uh, participate in the project. So um, as you walked in, you could match the, the size of a particular uh, portrait and animate it. Um, we, we call this reverse puppetry, right? Like you're, you're kind of uh, uh, giving them uh, a life. And the nice thing about shadows is that most, most people know what to do with their shadow, right? There's no learning curve or there's no interface or some physical <laughs> manifestation. And um, most uh, cultures have a tradition of shadow puppetry or shadow theater. And then we all play at home, you know, with our shadows when we're kids or whatever. So that, this artwork was really close because of that. And so this project was presented in Rotterdam for about, um, I think it was three or four weeks, uh, every night from um, dusk to, to midnight. And, um, and every night it was very different, right? Like on weekends, there was a lot of kids. Um, Tuesdays was methadone night at a nearby church, so all the addicts would come out. Uh, it was just really diverse. Um, technologically, it had a surveillance uh, camera which was detecting the position of the shadows. This is the very early version of our computer vision tracking system. Um, and what we would do is whenever a shadow and a portrait would match, automatically we would send a little MIDI signal as sound on public space to tell people, tick, you know, you've, you've activated that portrait. But more importantly, when all of the portraits of a given scene were already revealed by the public, automatically the system would black out and cue new portraits so that people could reorganize in space. Because for me, what was important is not so much this you know, parade of portraits, but rather becoming the portrait. So you see these people here, they reveal the existing portraits, computer blacks out, cues a new image, and brings out uh, more movement, um, sort of inviting the public to reorganize. These projectors um, make 30 by 30 meter images, but they're not video projectors, they're slide projectors, they're robotic slide projectors, um, which is how come we could actually reach these, these scales. And then pretty much like the Samuel von Hochstraten um, engraving, uh, you start seeing this kind of monstrous uh, behavior arrive. And so there's a lot of uh, games of scale that start taking place. A man on a wheelchair projected himself 30 meters high, crushing everybody under his wheels and deriving a lot of pleasure, for, for example. <laughs> or in uh, Austria, you had a little chihuahua dog and it was tiny and everybody was underneath the chihuahua. Um, the tracking system is projected, it's shown publicly, it's displayed. Uh, we call that the Brechtian moment. We want people to sort of understand how they're being observed with explanations in English and Dutch. And it's also like a really good kind of uh, uh, nerdy thing, you know, for people like me to see how it's done. But most of the people didn't really care about, about that. <laughs> most of them would just play with each other. So these kinds of ad hoc narratives are, um, you know, I have hours and hours of this material. <laughs> so for instance, this lady, she abused her boyfriend for about three hours.
So, um, yeah, so with this works, um, one thing that's interesting to think about in public space is, well, how do you create connective environments, environments that where, you know, tens uh, or, or even hundreds of people can participate? Um, with a piece like Victorial, you take turns, right? Like you have the lights for 15 seconds or whatever it takes to make your design, and then it moves on to the next one, but everybody else is a passive spectator. In this particular project, it's different because anyone who crosses the light, and you must cross because this is at the plaza, so there is no option. So everybody's casting their shadow. They become um, integrated into the bigger tableau. But at the same time, you have your own representation. So, so there's, a, there's something about this mechanism that was really successful. And we've shown this project in, um, in uh, many, many cities. And with every city that we show it, we learn something about the performance that we sort of carry with us and the way that we want to represent ourselves. And one of the reasons why I'm sort of showing this project in the context of out of control is because n nobody tells you there's a right or wrong way to do things. Um, sometimes, for instance, one of the things that we see in a piece like this, um, I'll show you a different version. This one's in Austria, in the uh, Hauptplatz in Linz. Uh, and the projections are taking place right on the uh, mayor's office. So that's, that's good. Um, there is, there is, for instance, often you get this 17-year-old um, boys who are drunk and they put out their penis, right? And they like show how big their penis is. And then you let them do it. And then about three seconds after they do that, they go, oh, I'm so radical. Now, now they think something else. Um, if you were to forbid the idiots to do that, then it would become about that. But if you let them do it, it's self-organizing. It is self, um, it arranges the behaviors according to the rest of the people who are there. So it's a very nice kind of um, lesson. And then another thing that's neat is, uh, I was saying we presented in many places, um, it breaks certain stereotypes. For instance, my stereotype of Latinos, like myself, is that we like to hug and touch and whatever, yet when we showed this in Portugal, everyone was like, okay, you're over there, I'm not going to touch you, I'm very careful. Then when we showed it in, in Liverpool, in England, my very first time I was in England, um, my stereotype of British people was stiff upper lip and propriety and class and whatever, and they were just like taking down their pants and peeing and just orgies. It was just incredibly... Uh, Interesting. The the Brits, the Brits really like to take off their clothes. <laughs> Dissimulation. So I sort of started my work at a time when everything was about simulation, right? About this idea of virtuality. I know it's boring, but it's back, and everybody's talking about like helmets and stuff like that. And this is the idea of of suspending your disbelief. The idea that you go into your helmet and for a little while you will believe that these fake graphics are actually real so that you can be a part of the of the experience. And I always thought that was strategic um, and important and political is to actually not simulate but dissimulate. To take existing buildings for instance and make them pretend to be something other than themselves. And so um, a lot of the, the idea of dissimulation, a lot of the idea of my work is to accept that I'm working with special effects, right? I'm working with techniques of trompe of anamorphosis, of, of make-belief. And art, for in my opinion, has always been about that kind of construct, right? This, this falsity. And everybody knows that this is false, and that's a key thing, right? There's a um, complicity um, in, in the work. So um, in 2005, um, we made this project, which is another shadow play. Um, but this time, the portraits are on the floor. And the portraits are not photos, but they're actually um, interactive video sequences. So you walk into a plaza. The, the last plaza we did this was at, at Trafalgar Square in London. And uh, we have a very powerful projector. And inside of your shadows, you find people. But when you find them, they find you. So there are over a thousand portraits taken in the city where the project is shown, and then they're kind of sleeping. And then as you approach them, they wake up and establish eye contact. And for as long as you're in front of this sort of ghost-like presence, the portrait will stay there. It'll just kind of, um, we call that scrubbing the playhead. It's kind of like they're kind of going fast and, and so on.
But then the moment that you're no longer interested, they're also not interested. So I'll show you in a second. How do I fast forward? Oh no, fast forward's not working. Oh well, we'll wait. We'll wait for it. Um, the the um, the yeah, anyway. So the portraits um, they're taken in the cities where 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 we um, show the project, and we give complete freedom to the volunteer to do whatever they want to do, and that's a really important part. Now, this is what I was telling you. If you walk away, the portrait loses interest as well, goes back to sleep, and disappears. And then it, this portrait can appear anywhere within, I don't know, I think it's like 1,000 square meters um, in the plaza. And it didn't happen often, but sometimes we would find that people would find themselves. And that was straight out of David Lynch. It was kind of like, oh, okay, that's weird. Um, I often say that my work is as big as my insecurities. And so... Uh, in this project, for instance, we use the world's brightest projector. It's 110,000 ANSI lumens, if you know your lumens. Um, and um, yeah, and, and so we use that project to create the shadows. And then we have um, these uh, robotic um, video projectors, which can place the robots anywhere within that area. But the key part of this project is this tracking system, which actually not only detects where people are, it predicts where they're going to be into the future. So if you see the ones on the right, there's that little crosshairs, and it's just sort of saying, well, this person is bound to be here in about three seconds' time. And that's important because it helps us uh, make the portraits go to the, to the public. So, for instance, this guy here is walking here, so then the computer can say, okay, well, then grab this robot and put a portrait in this back. And while most people don't care about the fact that, that, uh, that this is happening, for me it's crucial because I don't want the portraits to come to you. I want you to go to the portraits and to have a higher chance of finding them. Um, technically as well, the, the portraits are rotated and scaled and undeformed so that no matter where you are, they're actually um, perfectly present inside of your shadow. This project is inspired by La Invención de Morel, Morel's Invention, by Adolfo Bioy Casares. If you haven't read this, it's a 1941 novel uh, by an Argentinian writer who Borges said it was the perfect novel. And this novel talks about this new post-photographic device that can capture three-dimensional representations. Um, and so this idea that the, 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 the recording coexists with the people is something that comes from that... Uh, from that 70 years ago or whatever. This is an example of, uh, this is a photo of the thousands of people who participated. And uh, the, recording, the recording process was as follows. We, we had these stations and then local filmmakers would invite people to um, do whatever it is that they want to do, but at one point look straight at the camera. And that's the point that we trigger when you uncover them with your shadow. So most people, you know, they do sign language, they dance, they, you know, it's England, so they take off their clothes, of course, whatever they do. Um, and um, some have like, uh, like, uh, well, the Yukon guy is this. Uh, this guy says, you look because I'm not homeless, so some political stuff anyway. And the idea is that that is not my determination, that, that the project should have uh, its own... Um, its own um, life. So that's underscan, and this is part of dissimulation. Yeah. So this idea of the coexistence of the memory with uh, with the presence. So the key idea is um, is <coughs> Timothy Drucker's idea that presence and absence are not mutually exclusive. That at any given time, as I speak to you, we have v other voices which are um, sort of coexisting in here. Relationship specific. So most of the artists that I sort of grew up, um, you know, honoring and, and admiring uh, were people who like, you know, like Christopher Dishko, uh, like Hans Hakes, like Rachel White Reed, people who would do site specific works, which would deconstruct the narratives of power of a particular monument or building or plaza or whatever. And because that material is so well done, I thought, okay, well, I need to work not on site specificity, but what I call relationship specificity. 
the idea that these projects are actually tourable produ productions and that as you take them from one place to another, that they, um, you know, that they have a different performance, so to speak. Um, so many of the relationships that I seek to investigate are, are, are recycled, and I've been criticized for that. One of the relationships I use a lot is uh, the heartbeat. So we have sensors which measure the heartbeat of participants, and then we do things with it, a lot of different things. This is one of them. This is um, in Madison Square Park in New York City. Um, it's 200 theatrical spotlights along the perimeter of um, the central oval lawn of the park. And uh, we have a sensor that is very similar to what you might find at a gym. So it's got these two electrodes, you hold on to them, and then we measure the electrical resistance of your skin and detect your heartbeat. And as we do, the entire 200 spotlights start flashing with your heartbeat. But as we do that, we also record your heartbeat and we loop it in such a way that when you release it, your recording goes to the very first light bulb in the array. And then all the previous memories, all the previous recordings get pushed down one position over so that at any given time, as you're walking in that plaza or in that, in that park, you're surrounded by the 200 vital signs of the 200 most recent participants. So this project, as, as many of the, of the Pulse projects, um, they were inspired by, um, right here at the Royal Vic, uh, my wife was pregnant with twins. And um, being a nerd, I asked the doctor to bring two ultrasound machines so that we could simultaneously hear the, boy, the boys and the girls' heartbeats. And they were very different. They were syncopating and making this rhythm. And I thought that that was really neat. Uh, how can we visualize the fact that, yeah, we have this kind of universal metric, this rhythm that goes, but it's also very intimate. But it, it's just out of phase, you know? So if you listen to uh, a lot of uh, minimalist music like Glenn Branca or Steve Reich or Colin and Carol, you recognize that there is this possibility of creating this kind of bigger effect. And this is what I was saying, you know, like just people hanging out. That's the most sort of political thing that I can contribute. Just people hanging out is a good thing. So that's uh, Pulse Park that we've done in, in, in several different cities. And uh, here's a, a more uh, sort of large version of that. We just did this one in Abu Dhabi last year. And so <laughs> these are, again, searchlights. And there is a, a central um, sensor. And in this version, what we did is we um, make formations based on the systolic and diastolic activity of your heart. So the actual sort of signature movement of these lights, and as well as the, the heart beating, is all coming from your heartbeat. And there is an extremely ridiculous um, sort of connection between your intimate biometrics and then making that into an urban spectacle. Um, these lights uh, can be seen from a 15 kilometer radius. So let's just go forward. Do, do, do. So. So the kind of thing that, that we're seeking to do pretentiously is to create intimacy in public space. So how do you take this intimidating, you know, sort of military or corporate technologies and you create something that has a personal relationship? So that's uh, Abu Dhabi. Critical. So um, no catharsis, um, no suspension of disbelief, as I already uh, mentioned with dissimulation. Um, most of the work that I admire is work that um, that uh, approaches um, politics, history, architecture, gender, I mean, any number of, of issues um, from a very sort of critical standpoint and creates an interruption in, uh, in um, the narratives of power or whatever, um, which is different than the deconstruction of narratives of power. It's just an interruption. Um, and one particular um, sort of opportunity I had 
was to work for the the memorial for the student massacre of Tlatelolco in 1968 in Mexico for the 40th anniversary. So when you think about the work of uh, Johann Gertz, for instance, one of my idols, um, who's familiar with Johann Gertz? Not many? Okay, so for instance, in jo Johann Gertz was this German-French artist who was invited, for example, to do the me Hamburg Memorial for, um, for the Holocaust. How do you represent that? I mean, how do you begin to make something that's powerful with that? And so what he did, is fabulous, is he made this enormous monolith, black monolith, in the middle of Hamburg. And over time, people wrote on it and whatever, scratched it, graffiti it, whatever. But over time, the entire monolith uh, was actually going into the ground. And so today, after several years, it, the, the monolith is now un, under the earth. And if you go to the plaza, there's nothing. There's a little plaque that explains what happens. And then you can stand on top of the footprint of the monolith. I mean, I get goose pimples, right? Like it's just so uh, moving that the way to remember something like that is the disappearance of this monolith. It's just brilliant. Um, and like that, you know, I think that artists who sort of ask us not just to be on the consuming end, end uh, sort of end of like the name of, of victims or whatever, we need to activate the sites um, for people to, to continue, you know, a struggle in a way. <coughs> so, um, if you know the story of, uh, of Tlatelolco, 10 days before uh, the Olympics were to take place in Mexico in 68, um, Students gathered peacefully at Tlatelolco Square. The Mexican government went there with snipers. The snipers shot at the military who was there, um, and the military shot back at the students, killed, depending on who you ask, about 300. And then that very night, they cleaned up all of the blood, and uh, the media was complicit, and nobody found out that this had happened. So until about 12 years ago, this has been taboo. This is not something that's been discussed. But today, the Tlatelolco site is a cultural center from the university, from UNAM, and they were the ones who invited me to make uh, a piece. <coughs> so I was inspired by the work of estridentista poets. In Mexico, in the 1920s, the pioneers of radio broadcasts were the poets. Maplesarse, eh, Miguel de Casa, and so on. They had things like the Manifesto for Antenna Man. And uh, one of the pieces is called Magna Voz, is this enormous loudspeaker on the top of the Popocatépetl volcano, which kind of disseminates voices and radio waves that everybody just can hear. And so this idea of like a place to speak and a, and a place to speak freely was uh, interesting. So this is the, um, so let me just show you the actual project. Um, so the, the, the student protest is something that, as you may know, Mexico, a lot of the activity that is happening today in, in terms of massacres of Acteal, the 43 students that were just kidnapped and possibly murdered in Ayotzinapa and so on, ask us to look at this material not as something that happened in the past, but something that is ongoing. So the proposal is this. So as a person approaches his megaphone, which is placed right in the site of the massacre, her or his voice becomes light, and it hits the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And crucially, this is unmoderated and uncensored. Anybody can take the mic. Over the period of several weeks that this project was live, we got all sorts of different participants, a lot of survivors telling their stories, uh, political manifestos, rappers, poets, um, and we saw some really touching things. We saw a man say, my name's so-and-so, and I'm here to say that I'm the son of one of the soldiers who committed the massacre, and I've lived with this guilt all my life, and I'm here to just say I'm a new generation. I mean, it was just like really touching stuff. We had another guy who was um, 
a fireman and he says my name's so and so and I'm here to denounce that routinely the government asks us to put a coloring inside of our water tank so when we spray protesters they can be easily identified and I became a fireman to protect people not to be part of the apparatus of repression I mean it was just you guys it was non-stop just really incredible stuff um, the idea of giving like an open mic in a society that to this date has um, uh, Jesus uh, Rodriguez calls it, she says that there's no censorship in Mexico until you get killed. So that's kind of wh where we're at. But to give that microphone to the neighbors and to the people and survivors and so on was important. And I, you know, consider this project highly not because of what I did, but because the way that people participated. So let's just fast forward a bit. Now, when people spoke, their voice would, go, would hit the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and from there, three other lights would beam the voices to the rest of the city. And again, this is the same kind of searchlight, so it can be seen from 15 kilometer radius. So when you were at home or you were in your car driving or you were at work and you would see the night sky in Mexico and you see these beacons of light, uh, we did this thing where we also broadcast live over 96.1 FM radio what the lights were saying so that you could hear eavesdrop into the lights at any given time from anywhere in the city. So, so the idea of actually using the media itself to sort of close that loop of communication. Now, because the project was uh, a radio program, in fact, it was Radio UNAM, the university radio station, when no one was speaking, we had to fill the time. And so what we did is we brought in a lot of archival material from survivors of the massacre, intellectuals, interviews, even music from 68. And so that was being played back and we would mix the recordings and the archive material um, together with the live participation of people. And in that way, we felt that this memory was not just being seen in a necrophiliac and vampiric way, but rather as something that was being activated by current events. And again, of course, it wasn't all just dark. We also had uh, marriage proposals and shout outs and all sorts of fun stuff. So that's Bos Alta. Um, Um, alien memory. So what does not belong? Uh, a lot of the work that I do, even though it may have like a grand scale, um, is experiments and, and, and it's basically the idea of the juxtaposition of things that do not belong, that, that are alien. Not that they're new, but they're, they're not belonging. And so one example of that is um, in 2010, we uh, built the world's uh, largest spherical uh, balloon and uh, this is its size and we floated it in Federation Square in Melbourne and um, we animated it with five projectors um, all around it and underneath it with um, simulations of the behaviors at the surface of the Sun so we had these computers which were actually using these equations uh, like uh, Navier-Stokes, Perlin noise, uh, reaction diffusion, fractal flames, and they were trying to simulate the way that the actual um, explosions in the sun take place. And so we put this sun um, in the nighttime of, of Melbourne, and it was technically quite a complicated thing to do because you think, oh, well, they just put a balloon and then they project it on. But one of the problems with balloons is that they bob and sway. Um, and so we actually had uh, 3D tracking of the balloon so that as it, can, as it moves, the computer graphics actually match the movement, kind of like a mapping uh, project. And because this is not actually a video uh, recording, it's not a looping thing, it's actually live and you can actually participate in it. So you would download this free software for, um, for devices 
and you could actually seed the different equations, choose different um, different solar seasons. You know how we have four seasons? The sun has 11 years of seasons. So we would sort of allow people to, to, to sort of, um, you know, look through through those. Let me just fast forward so you can see that. So uh, there I am touching the, the surface and you see that little dot on the surface of the sun. That's actually what's seeding uh, all of the equations. Why we did this, I have no idea. Um, and here's the, uh, let me just show you, this is the, the calibration pattern, which was a, a nightmare. Um, but the sun is, I mean, in terms of, of iconography, I'm, I'm very interested. You know, the, the light artists, the, especially the, the idea of uh, people like Irwin or like James Turrell, this is people that I admire a lot. But they come from a tradition which is almost a Quaker tradition of light art, where they have the light inside and they have a whole bunch of spiritual reasons and so on and so forth. I come from a different kind of tradition. I come from... Uh, my parents were nightclub owners in Mexico, and so for me, light is the place where, you know, transvestites walk around and you get lost. You know, you can be someone other than yourself. Or it's also the light of, uh, of interrogation, you know, the light of the military helicopters looking for Mexicans at the border, the light, um, Goethe called it, you know, the, the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. So I'm part of that, right? Like this idea that the sun, in a way, is this majestic image of our time, right? Like uh, it, it's, it's uh, this, you know, incredible um, fusion reactions um, which give life to us. Um, and just iconography of, of the violence of that explosion is something that attracts me um, in a kind of gothic way. So this version, this version of the project is in, um, in uh, Inquisition Church in Mexico City is a um, 16th century Inquisition church. And the, the sun simulation has this big pendulum that can travel the entire um, 18 meter of the, of the nave of the church. And one of the reasons I love working in Mexico is because if you fall, uh, the, the security guard comes and says, are you okay? And then you say, well, you know, I broke my knee or something. And they go, yeah, you gotta be careful. Um, I love that. I love that because working anywhere else is just like you permits and health and safety and whatever you can't do it. Um, but so yeah, so then we made this this piece here. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, so alien memory, incomplete. The piece needs to be incomplete. Um, the piece needs to be um, a platform, as I was saying. So it used to be that we would be invited to see a work and it was inspiring, you know, like you would go to be inspired with the vision of the artist. Well, today the situation is quite different. Now it is the artwork that is looking at the public, listening to the public, sensing him or her. It is the artwork that is expecting the public, to, the public and the curators, of course, to do something interesting with them. So there's a, a, a little bit of a change in the way that, that, that we present works because there are living things. Um, we've always known this, of course, and we've always known that art is aware. But I think with this kind of participatory art, um, it's, it's very, very uh, uh, clear. So most of the works would not really even exist unless you had participation. So in this particular project, Sandbox, we put two... Um, sandboxes on risers, on little stages, um, in the Santa Monica beach in LA. And we put these projectors on a crane. When you stick your hand into the sandbox, there is automatically like a camera that beams your image to the beach. But at the same time, we're also recording people on the beach with infrared cameras so that their presence is being projected onto the sandbox. So you see those little uh, black uh, shadows? That's the people on the beach. So they see you and you see them. And you share this three scales, right? Like the scale of just being one-to-one, um, uh, -one, then the enormous scale of amplified graphics, and then the tiny scale of the, of the sandbox. And in a project like this, for instance, this is a project that costs like, I don't know, $180,000, right? And somebody pays for it. And then that somebody shows up at the opening. 
and then the project starts and then they look at me and there's nothing to see because no one's participating and it's very uncomfortable for about 45 seconds and then finally like a six-year-old kid goes in and starts playing and then everybody starts playing and it just becomes something oftentimes these technologies are used you know to tell us you know sort of pre-conceived um, stories but the power of this kind of uh, platform in my opinion is this um, fact that they're out of control. So it's LA, so <laughs> people put booties in their, in, their, in their dogs, and there's all sorts of stuff, but I'll fast forward. Um, why, why, why? Why is that so difficult? Look at me fumble at the control, so I don't know what's wrong. Um, well, we'll wait until the guy who... Um, this guy, for instance, he likes to burn people. So then... <laughs> or here's a uh, Coca-Cola guy. So you, you can imagine. I mean, it's just like non-stop um, props and, and fun stuff. All right. Self-representation, so um, in keeping with the idea of it being incomplete, um, the content is crowdsourced. So in this um, project, we use um, these um, digital um, magnifying glass, like uh, microscope, microscopes, microscopes um, to record the fingerprints of every participant. So we have this interface. And I really like in a show like this to ask people to insert their finger into the orifice. <laughs> and then they do. And as they do, there's a little electrocardiogram. And we record the, their, uh, their fingerprint. So this is this lady's electrocardiogram, her fingerprint, and this 101 beats per minute. And then every person who participates, their fingerprint and pulse is added to the tableau. And... Uh, at any given time, this particular installation in Sydney, Australia, shows over 10,000 fingerprints of the past 10,000 participants, and it ends up being in the real fingerprint size. We're almost there. Experimental. The outcome is unknown. A lot of the projects are, are experiments, and uh, the, one of the reasons to do them is because we don't know how people will react uh, with them. Um, we're always right at the borderline between the seduction of participation and the violence of policing the public, right? So that's, I think, where media art works best. So for this project, um, oh, I'll tell you an anecdote. In that very same show in Paris, Le Monde made a review of my show, and they called it Rafael Lozano Hemmer, the megalo-democrat. And I quite liked it, right? I was like, oh, shit, yeah, I'm a mega low Democrat. But they didn't mean it as a compliment, of course. And then I read it. It's like, they're so good. Um, and they had a really great point, And I completely, absolutely um, agree with them. And that's that oftentimes when you're speaking about participation, myself and many of my colleagues speak about a very emancipatory kind of talk, as if an artwork was better because it had the participation or the tracking of the people. And that is, of course, bullshit. Um, the, 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 there are a variety of different uh, sort of inputs and, and effects that, and, 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 and affects and, and agency that you want to create with artworks. It just depends on a piece by piece basis. But I designed this one um, just thinking about that. In this piece, if you participate too much, you die. So it works like this. It's um, 61 brown paper bags which are inflating and deflating around 10,000 times a day, which is the respiratory frequency for an adult at rest. They inflate and deflate. There is this beautiful organ of valves designed by Stefan Schultz, which um, activates them. And there is this room where you press a button, doors open, you go into a decompression chamber, all the fresh air leaves the decompression chamber. And once all of the fresh air is gone, Another set of doors opens, and it invites you to go into this hermetically sealed chamber to breathe the air that has already been breathed by everybody before you. So you sit there, and um, there's nothing to do except breathe. 
And as you do, the, your breath goes into this large tube, which then it's taken to these, um, these robotic bellows, which are inspired by uh, 17th century um, organs in churches, and then into the, into the uh, manifold, the actual valves, and to the, the bags. And the entire system just keeps all of the viruses, bacteria, pheromones of anybody who is in there. And there's this huge warnings right on the walls they say you know warning one panic in order to get out of this you actually have to go through the decompression chamber again so that we can preserve all of the stale air number two is contagion we don't have a single filter there so you are sharing all of these viruses and bacteria and number three is uh, asphyxiation because we calculate that there's about 10 days worth of oxygen in there um, but we ask people to stay no more than 10 minutes and much to my surprise with this work, I mean, I designed it so no one would go in. I certainly wouldn't go in. I, I was the first one to go in, and then I never went back in. Um, it's meant to be disgusting um, and for you to just sort of observe the people who are trying it. But we've shown it three times. The first show was in Istanbul, second in, in Madrid, and now in Mexico City. And in all cases, people are lining up to go in. It's just incredible, especially in Madrid, because when it was being shown in Madrid, uh, if you remember, the first case of Ebola, Zaire, outside of Africa was in Madrid, right? And people, this is happening and people are lining up. I'm like, guys, are you reading the warnings? And, uh, and uh, yeah, but they still go in. But in Mexico, I forbid um, children to go in. I just didn't want that responsibility. It's true that in terms of risk, the piece is as much of a risk as you might have with the circulating air of an airplane or an elevator or something like that. So it's not that. It's more just to create this conscience of the limit of this atmosphere, right? Like, how do we take the commons, so the water, the earth, the, the air we breathe, and we sort of assemble it in a storefront, you know, that is hermetically sealed and makes us sick. Um, when we breathe, the breath is inside of us, and it's private, and then it becomes public. A lot of artists, from Duchamp to Abramovic to many people, have worked on this idea of the recycling of air. But this is an entire machine um, to experience that kind of uh, gentil, that, that kind of, como se dice gentil, like crowd or whatever. So, experimental, two more, nonlinear. Um, but I already said this, no beginning, no end, no score. Um, so this is an example um, work, again, using the voice, um, the idea of, of uh, people freely speaking into uh, a public uh, installation. And so this is um, uh, Park Avenue Tunnel in New York City. It's seven city blocks long. And what we did is we put um, 300 spotlights each of which is associated to a loudspeaker with its own sound channel. In the middle of the tunnel, we have uh, an intercom system, and you press the intercom, you speak into it, you leave your voice, and as you add your voice, all the previous recordings move toward the exit of the tunnel. So as you walk down the tunnel, you hear the voices of New Yorkers speaking, um, and again, it's, it's, it's an open mic, so you get everything from people reciting poetry, shout outs, again, marriage proposals that is kind of tacky. The guy proposed and she said yes, and then they walk together as their memory travel through the, through the, <laughs> the tunnel. But in, especially in New York City, it's so important to take over the infrastructure, right? Because there is an understandable panic and mania about security and so on in New York. And as I was sort of working on, on this project, I um, had a meeting with NYPD, and they said to me, well, Rafael, you know, we're going to have to introduce a, a six-second delay so that we can, you know, ensure that we can censor and control what people say. And then I did a thing that as a Mexican-Canadian uh, um, is, is something that I think uh, I've always wanted to do. Is like I've seen it in movies. I said, this is America. Uh, <laughs> And it is your job to protect freedom of speech. And, uh, and I just went off and I went on like, and, and they just said, yeah, okay, you know, you're right. And, and, uh, and they did not censor it. And it was really, really great. And later I found out what they were worried about 
uh, understandably, is this was uh, a few months after the Boston Marathon bombing. So what they were worried is that somebody would go onto the mic and say, there's a fire or a bomb or something I create, because there's 10,000 people inside of the tunnel. Um, so what we did is we made them a little button. It's like a little button that, uh, that a docent had. So this docent was like a freedom of speech activist. And she could press the button and immediately uh, remove anyone who actually said, oh, there's fire or something like that. And what would happen is as she would press it, this memory would go away and we would put in Laurie Anderson or Kathy Acker or Garcia Lorca or some, some content related to New York, which would sort of bring up the level. And I'm really happy to say that in the entire month of the exhibition, not one time did that button get pressed. So it's a very important sort of message, you know, that uh, you, know, I, you can trust the public to bring it up a notch. Um, Nonlinear, so these pieces, for example, um, they are um, they're 3D printed objects in different materials. Um, the spheres have embedded in them loudspeakers. So each one of those little dots that you see there are headphone uh, loudspeakers. And uh, what we do is we play back a different track of music in each one of those loudspeakers simultaneously. So the sphere on the left is the collected compositions of Karlheinz Stockhausen. So if you know Stockhausen, he was a pioneer of electronic music. And so his 230 compositions are playing back in this aluminum fiber um, sphere. To his right is Richard Wagner. Now, Wagner was our very first sphere. He's 3D printed in porcelain. And he only did 110 compositions. But of course, one is like, you know, the, the Nebelung cycle, one is Tristan and Isolde, then it's like enormous operas, like six hours long and whatever, right? Then we have Hildegard von Bingen. Um, and then the big one is Mozart. Mozart is, is it 600 channels, you guys? It's about 520 channels or something like that was Mozart. Um, so you can see Wagner kind of twisting in his grave. Um, <laughs> and now we just did one for Mexico uh, for my current show there, which is Schubert, which is 998. It's enormous. And the biggest composer would be uh, Bach, which did 1,100 1, compositions. So we play them back simultaneously. There is no 3D printer in the planet that can print a sphere that is as big as Bach. But some of the interesting things about this, so this is uh, Mozart next to uh, Mahler. Mahler is 3D printed in, in silver. So here's a, a view of, of several. Um, you have uh, John Cage, um, Ligeti. This is uh, the Wagner to give you the scale with Orion, who's here. Hi, Orion. <laughs> I, always, I show you everywhere I go. You're my model. Uh, so that's Mozart. And one of the interesting things about these projects is that they're parametric objects. So no, no hand touches them while they're being modeled. They're modeled by equations, which basically spread the speakers so that each sphere is directly proportional to how prolific the composer was. So as, as uh, the sphere brings it out. But then there is a process, which is almost an artisanal process, like a clockmaker, mostly uh, Carolina here and another guy, Sergio. Um, just insert each one of these loudspeakers. And so even three years ago, the possibility of having 100 channels of sound simultaneously was really difficult to achieve. At the studio, we developed these little, basically, wave players with uh, tiny uh, micro SD cards, which allow us to do thousands of channels simultaneously. And the sound of it is, you, you know, when you hear it from far away, it's just like cacophony, but as you put your ear real close to it, you can hear the individual tracks. So that's the completed object. And the final one is Intimate, um, against intimidation and for personalization. So this is a piece, actually, which uh, was acquired by the Musée de Beaux-Arts. Um, it's... This is um, Omara Portuondo, the singer for Buena Vista Social Club. We asked her to breathe, to, to, um, to breathe into this brown paper bag, to, to sigh into brown paper bag. And so she does. And then we take her breath and we hook it up to one of our respir respiration machines. And so this piece, um, just keeps the breath of Omara Portuondo uh, traveling from the brown paper bag to a motorized bellows. 
and it's all designed to be transparent, just like the asphyxiation piece, just so that you can see the whole flow of the air. The machine also sighs 158 times a day, uh, which I, I mean, I just found this number in Wikipedia. It's like apparently we sigh uh, 158 times. So the machine does the same. And this project is a biometric portrait. So uh, when Omar Portondo dies, this project is going to the National Museum of Music in Cuba, where people can go and visit the last breath of Omar Portondo. So it's a very ridiculous kind of uh, project. And, uh, and for Montreal, what we're hoping to do is to put the breath of uh, Leonard Cohen. We still haven't been able to catch him, but when we do, it's like 30 seconds of breath and, or three seconds, I don't know, quick. All right, and then the last project I'm going to show you before we go for, um, oh, first to talk and then to drink, is um, this one, which was shown already here at Concordia. Um, with uh, Jen at um, FOFA. Um, so as you may know, um, a year ago, um, the Mexican government, many instances of Mexican government kidnapped 43 students um, aged between 17 and 21 years old from the town of Iguala in Guerrero, the Ayotzinapa uh, Normalista School. These are kids who are learning to be teachers. And uh, we can't find them. We don't know where they are. According to the Mexican authorities, they were captured by the police and given to the Guerreros Unidos drug cartel. And then the Guerreros Unidos drug cartel murdered them and burnt them. And so today we don't know where the, the remains are. This is the official story. And a lot of people have gone to jail. But the evidence does not add up. Like there is no evidence that there was ever a fire that can actually get rid of 43 bodies. There's many inconsistencies and the government has been very uh, opaque in being forthcoming about the information about these disappeared students. And so at this time, the families of the disappeared are still looking for them. And so we thought at the studio, well, wait a minute, we work a lot with face recognition and we work a lot with these kinds of uh, police and military technologies of identification. So in this project, what we did is we created a, a project whose entire job it is to look for the students. So it's kind of like a mirror. As you stand in front of the piece, the piece captures your face and it measures your facial features. And it looks at the shape of your, of your jaw and the distance of your eyes to your nose and so on and so forth. And it compares you to the 43 students. And it makes for each one of them to a, a search for which one of, of them looks closest to you. And as it finds which one it is, it spits out a result, a level of confidence, which is what in, in computer vision is this, this confidence that the system has that you are indeed that student. Oftentimes, most often, the result is like in the top left, you see it, confianza, 20%, 17%, is very low. Unless you are one of the students, the confidence is going to be very low. And then it says resultado, result, student not found. So this project um, is not really an artwork um, in the sense that um, it's a project that is more of a strategic platform to, to search for the disappeared. Oftentimes, these technologies are used for the culprits. You know, well, who is the suspicious person? You know, we know in Mexico who the culprits are. They're in power. So what we're doing here is we're trying to reverse those mechanisms to now look for the victims. And when we presented this project first here in Montreal at the CBC, um, the, the, the CBC did an interview and they're like, well, Rafael, the situation in Mexico is very dire. And I said, yeah, yes, it is. In fact, it is. And, and I'm happy to, to make projects like this to, to speak about this situation and visualize this disappearance. Um, but I would love, for instance, for this very same software to be used not to look for, for the 43 disappeared Mexican students, but to look for the over 1,000 Aboriginal women that have disappeared over the past three years in this very country. Uh, or for instance, this very project right now, because this is, by the way, this is available in uh, open source in our GitHub. Um, you can download that and you can make your own versions. So in Argentina, in the Universidad de Tierra del Fuego right now, they're recoding our software not to look for the 43 disappeared students, but to look for over 10,000 disappeared people from the dictatorship. 
So the, the notion that this project is more viral, you know, like you can download the entire project, you can recompile it, you can exhibit it anywhere you want, is something that we want to do as a way to go back to this Struckery idea that absence and presence are not mutually exclusive, that they coexist, that, that those students are somehow with us. And then that as you look at this mirror, there are fraternal connections to these kids to the degree that we are them. Uh, although that sounds facile and, 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 and trash, but, but there is a complicity, you know, that we have, or everybody who, 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 who forms part of this society, uh, you know, has to reflect on, on our own um, relationship to these structures of power. Anyway, um, the last thing about that project is that project, I also put it up for sale. And so I'm extremely happy to report. And the reason I did this is uh, we made it into an edition and we sell it to rich people. And the entire proceeds of the, of the piece go directly to the families. Um, the, the, the kids, some of them had kids, and so there's orphans. And anyway, so the families right now really are in desperate need of support because they're trying to keep a legal case going and so on and so forth. So this project is actually generating income uh, for them. And the reason I'm proud to announce that is because I just met with, uh, what are they called? Giverny Foundation, which is an art uh, collection here in Montreal. And they acquired one of these works. And so the money was going to go um, to Mexico. So I, I was under a lot of um, criticism in Mexico because it's a very touchy thing to make a project about something like this. They were saying that I was somehow uh, benefiting or profiting from the, from the um, tragedy. And of course, I, I disagree because I, I do think that as an artist, you're a citizen and that you need to do whatever you can you know, to make a contribution. Um, I understand the point that they're saying, well, you could have released this maybe anonymously so that your name is not in these museums. But the problem is that had I done that, it might not have gone to like whatever has been to like 30 museums so far everywhere because of this insistence that this project can actually bring visibility. Um, I, I leave you with this slide, which is um, my contact and so on. Um, the GitHub. It's something that we are working on very much now. Um, it, at my studio, one of my longtime developers after 17 years is going back to Edmonton. And so there's a really interesting question of, well, how do you then conserve hundreds of projects that he's been working on? And we've decided to make the entire studio open source. We've, we've um, the USB key that you see there, it's uh, the entire schematics and source code for the 42 artworks that are currently being exhibited at the Muac Museum in Mexico City. You can buy the catalog or you can, oops, or you can buy all the code and schematics to make the artworks yourself. And we believe that that's a really important um, direction to go into because even though we are still complicit with the system of capitalism and materialism and will to power, uh, yes, we are complicit with all of that. We're sellouts. <laughs> At the same time, we believe that there is something very attractive about the idea of, of, of software as a dialogue, right? Like we benefit from open source. We want to give back. Um, there's also a question of conservation, right? Because a lot of the museums that end up buying my work want to know, well, what happens in 40 years' time, right? When, you know, you no longer have Windows 8 or Mac OS 10 or whatever. Um, and answering those questions is a very critical part of being able to um, consider um, making money and maintaining a platform uh, to continue creating. So if you like, uh, we can talk about that in the discussion or about any other um, thing that you like. So that's my presentation. Thank you. So are there any questions or complaints? <laughs> yes. Um, I was intrigued mainly when I just came in the room by the sound of cumbia music. Yeah. And, um, and as you showed, you know, I see that you implemented sound in your other works, like classical composers and everything. I see you work a lot with um, digital, you know, like the technological advancement. And I was curious to see where the cumbia music relates to that, because 
Um, aside from uh, Cumbia Digital, it's mostly like it's, it's very organic, very like uh, village side uh, kind of uh, genre. So I was uh, curious to see about the relation between like the Cumbia DJ set and the technological artwork. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't have um, like a, a very clean distinction between technology and nature, between the synthetic and the natural. I do believe, like we all do in Canada since, you know, 60 years ago, uh, you know, McInnes, McLuhan, uh, Grant, uh, in all of the philosophers that were telling us that technology is our second skin, that we are, you know, we are in in inseparable from it. So my experience of Cumbia is completely and absolutely mediated by digital media. And so I, I, I listen to a lot of electronic cumbia, but I also listen to the other um, type. I don't think, even if you're, suppose that you're a musician who has never played with any electrical instrument, you're still part of technological culture, in my opinion, because your country is, um, you know, working with virtual capital, for example, like all of the the uh, Producto Bruto, the national gross product is actually exchange of virtual capital that has no counterpoint in the physical world. Because your environment is about to disappear thanks to globalized communication and massive production. Because your language, if you're, say, an indigenous, uh, in an indigenous community, your language is about to disappear thanks to the massive consolidation into established global networks. Because, I mean, and so, so many reasons, right? Um, and so today I just see technology as something that's inevitable. Uh, why I work with technology is not because it's original or new, but it's because our war, our economy, our politics, our culture is already being fed through that, and it's not something that we can step outside of. The last guy to try that was Pol Pot. Didn't work out. So the cumbia thing, I think, is it's it's more like uh, like some of the really good cumbia artists that I like. They're from Australia, right? Like uh, what they called that? Uh, I'll tell you right now. Shit, what's the cumbia Australian cumbia? I, I, anyway, if you're interested, I'll give you uh, Australian or, or German cumbia. You know, there's, there's some really good tracks. Um, and I like that. I like that, you know, for as much as I detest certain aspects of globalization, uh, the fact that cumbia can reach uh, digitally to a lot of people is something that I'm, I enjoy and I benefit from. Yes? Oh, sorry. Okay, well, I see some hands over here. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come and talk to us. At the same time, I'm very disappointed that you change the topic from the drinking and dancing <laughs> to uh, your artwork. Um, yeah, me too. Rafael, I wanted to ask you, uh, what is, how, how do you determine the creative process when it comes to create again? Because you have a very large body of work, and I know that most uh, artists, they are very effective and they create a lot of work. They do have a methodology that they follow. It varies from project to project, I understand, but there's a core the steps that you might follow to in order to achieve the volume of that you have? Um, it's, it's a great question. I mean, more and more in my studio, I'm interested in managerial questions. Is this an extremely unpopular thing to talk to other artists about? It's taboo to speak about management of projects. But I think management of projects is a key thing to actually have the independence and the autonomy to continue creating. So I'm trying to become a, a better manager of which projects and how to actually get them done. Having said that, the truth is that I work out of denial. Um, there's as an anecdote. I took uh, this pill called uh, Ritalin. And uh, so I took this Ritalin. And all of a sudden, I got really depressed because my calendar, it just looked impossible. And so I got off of the Ritalin because I like to just pretend that everything's going to be okay. But the truth is, sadly, and my assistants are here so they know it's true, it's like we're always this cardiac, last minute, you know, just sort of creation. There's a lot of improvisation. Even with those enormous projects, some of which take years to actually get the funding and the planning and whatever, last minute you're improvising and you're coming through, um, you know, very, very close. Um, so 
I think that there's a lot of a lot to be said about that kind of disruptive emergency, you know, sort of driven creation that I don't think we'll ever get rid of. Sorry to inform you, uh, but but I do. I am trying to to articulate some things. Like for instance, some of the things that get lost, like reading, right? Like fuck, I, I want to read more. So how do I actually manage that? And it's it's a really serious question, you know, because I think, uh, you know, I laugh because a lot of the jokes I said today they're the same as I've been saying for fifteen years. You know, like I I want new material. Um, but uh, but it's a, it's a really fascinating question. It's like how how do you produce the conditions to be able to create um, and and also, which is which is related to money too, right? Because uh, that's a big taboo. Management is one, but money is even more of a taboo. We have this really annoying thing, artists, to pretend that we have this kind of bohemian disinterest in money and so on and so forth. It's not that I love champagne and ostentation, which I do, the champagne, not the ostentation, but is that it is the money that allows the studio to actually have a certain repeatability, a certain stability to continue creating. Uh, I recently met uh, Frank Stella, and Frank Stella says that um, he, his work is in the millions, right? Uh, he says that he makes enough money to feed his addiction to continue creating. And I, I love that because it's really the situation. Whether you're an artist who just works uh, in very modest means, certainly I've, I've been that too, uh, or whether you have some means, you're always right at the limit of what you actually would spend. So I think that there's something um, that we do need to consider, and that's sharing information about strategies to actually get budgets, for instance. I love to talk about that stuff. It's like, well, you know, how do you get funded? I mean, does anybody want to talk about that? About funding? Yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is really interesting because, it's, uh, because I think that those are questions that oftentimes are not discussed in an art school, right? As they shouldn't. I mean, they're, you know, they're more managerial things, but they're also fundamental for you to be able to, to turn down certain shows, for instance. At the studio, we've been offered, um, yesterday we got one from, from Cadillac. Cadillac wants us to like, do some kind of ad. And to be honest, I've worked with corporations before, so I'm not immune to accepting, but the conditions have to be right. A lot of the projects that you see, um, I literally prevent any logos from being presented. The reason I hardly work in North America, and most of my work is in Europe or Asia or Latin America, is because the moment that you show a logo in public space, you basically betray the trust that you've established with the public. They now see the project as an ad instead of an actual, uh, you know, sort of experiment or a, a, an actual uh, piece. So I work a lot with corporations, but only if I can control, um, diminish their logo creep and also, um, you know, just sort of ensure that the project has an independence and an autonomy. And um, it's, it's really hard. No one teaches you to do that. And I, I, I just wish somebody had taught me that. <coughs> Hey Rafael, thanks for sharing your, your time with us. And I was wondering if there's um, some place where we can see some of your uh, installations in Montreal soon. Um, I, there is a level of confidence is going to be shown at the Eastern Block uh, on the. Do you know? No, it's. Um, let me look it up. It's uh, so level of confidence is being presented at the Eastern Block on 17, 20. Eastern Block guys are here, right? No. Okay, they would tell us. Um, I think it's on the 20th of February. 20th of February, so level of confidence. But um, the the Musée d'Art Contemporain showed the pulse room piece so it's a piece with has like uh, i didn't show it today but it's like uh, uh heartbeat controlled incandescent light bulbs they also own a big searchlight project which i showed about two years ago and um, so i feel like i'm starting to to have representation of, of works here so that's nice but um other than the eastern block one i, I don't have others there was also questions down here right some other questions here. Yeah, I, I, is this on? Hello? 
<coughs> I'm just wondering, you, you, you were talking about the uh, 2,400 lumens or whatever it was. I don't remember the actual number. Uh, do, what kind of safety issues are, do you have with light and retinal damage or things like that? I'm just wondering yeah. how, how you deal with that. And yeah, and I mean... It's been ever a problem. N not so much. I mean, we have a very natural defense against that. You know, with the sun, we just know that we can't look at that, and you literally can't look at the at the light itself. So there's no, n there's never even been a complaint about that. What we do have um, issues with is with light pollution, because, for instance, the searchlight projects, they interfere with astronomy. They interfere with dark skies. They interfere with... Uh, you know, with migrating birds. So for instance, when we did the project in Montreal, we, uh, we worked with uh, Montreal's most important ornithologist, uh, whose name is Dr. Bird. So Dr. Bird, <laughs> he's awesome. Um, you know, it, we learned a lot from Dr. Bird because the spectral, the spectral response that the birds have to the lights um, goes toward the reds. And so we actually had infrared cut filters, red cut filters, so that the lights are literally transparent to the migrating birds in this, in this area. So things like that are always important. You know, you have to liaise uh, with, for example, airports. Um, airports don't like it when you shine these lights into, you know, aircraft landing routes. So in the case of the, of the search lights, what we do is we model the city in 3D, including the landing path, and we mathematically prevent search lights from ever hitting that location. So, you know, things like that are, are, are not part of what people see. They just go, oh, yeah, they put some search lights. But those search lights will never, for instance, point onto in Vancouver Burrard Bridge, you know, and people will be, you know, not, not being, getting that glare. Um, but that, what your question does remind me the end of my typical joke about my work being as big as my insecurities, and that's that I now go to psychotherapy, and so I'm okay with little things. Uh, and so that was the... The second, the second half of that two-part joke. Um, yeah. yeah I, I yeah. was also wondering if you could uh, leak one of your future projects. You, could you give us a, a teaser on something that you're working on that you? Sure. Um, one thing. So at the studio, to go back to production, um, we so we work out of out of um, a certain degree of ADHD, right? So we. We get good at something and then we move on to something else. One of the things that we're developing a lot in the studio is works with water. We're working a lot in fountains. We've already made some works with water, but the one that I'm, uh, one of the ones I'm really excited about one is now um, a very large uh, installation we're doing in Turkey, which is an evaporation fountain. So it's a, a very large uh, sort of tiled structure which gets flooded with water. And then we have almost a million um, small resistances, so like nichrome wires, that heat up individual tiles in this mosaic. So we can actually evaporate water and create images on the water. So that's something that we're working on now, and uh, we're really excited because it's such a bad idea. I always say that the good ideas are taken, you know, like uh, already. So you, if you think of a really bad idea, you must double down on that because. First of all, if somebody else has already done it, then you go, well, it was a bad idea. Um, so, you know, you're not as emotionally attached. But then secondly, I mean, these kinds of projects are, are impossible to do oftentimes, technically or logistically or financially. And so <coughs> we, we feel comfortable sort of approaching those things uh, very, um, the best we can. More questions? One more. Sure. One last question. I'm for drinks after water. Hello. Um, I really want to hear more about how you talk about how you talk about the financial issues because um, I know it's really hard to get started as an emerging artist. How you can finance your large project in a public space? Now you get famous, so it's very easy for you to get more attention, but. How do you how do you get started? Well, I mean, one thing is to keep in mind that the projects are vectorial, which means that the same concept you can realize it at a tiny scale and then you can supersize it. So when I started, of course, you know, I, I was dealing with what I had, like my computer, I was alone, I would 
developed uh, pieces that were in my reach. But those very same projects, as time went by and as I created like a dossier, I would manage to amplify the very same concept. So I'll give you an example. One of the very first pieces that I did that was successful, it was this eye that would follow you wherever you, you went. It's a piece from uh, 1992. And um, originally, it was done in Micromind Director, which you don't know what that is, but it's like a really shitty uh, multimedia software. And it was done in a very poor Mac 2 CI. And we showed it in a little monitor. And then as time went by, you know, different technologies uh, could happen. And then the scale of the work, you know, change the work in a way because now the eye can be like we showed it in Paris like six meters wide by four meters high but the original version of it is is still a tiny little piece so the idea that this project can migrate and scale according to your budget is a really interesting one the idea that that very first version of it the prototype so to speak is a proof of concept is an AP is an artist proof you take that to for instance, uh, a potential sponsor or funder, and you say, now you need to imagine this at this scale. Another thing that I do a lot of is I study precedents. Well, what, you know, how do people actually do this? What are, what are, what are people's costs in creating a, a fountain? A fountain is a really good example. Um, no public funding uh, body, um, especially if it's like in a, in a city, is outside of, of thinking about a fountain. Like if you bring up a fountain, they go, oh yeah, a fountain. You pay the money and then you know that six months into that, you're going to have to change the rusty valves and chlorinate the water and change the bulbs and there's some maintenance cost. So by pitching a lot of my works as fountains, you tap into that kind of idea that is the fountain as an emblematic place where people would gather for <coughs> abundance of, of, of water and so on. So that's a, a technique. Um, another thing that I do, and here's, here's a practical thing to do. Okay, so when you're proposing a project, what I do is I say, well, you know what, I want to earn, I don't know, $50,000 a year. Okay, as an artist, that's how much I want to earn. I'm going to spend six months in this project. The research and the development and all this is six months. So I need to earn $25,000 profit from this project, right? So then you go up to the, to the um, potential funding body and you say, guys, I, uh, I, need, uh, I, I, I need to make this project with you. Uh, I need to, the budget is $75,000, but I'm already putting in 25,000, right? Um, because you're never gonna get paid what you wanna get paid, but it should still be counted as part of your, uh, of your budget. And so what happens is all of a sudden the potential funder thinks, oh, well, you know, we already have like, you know, a third of the money or half of the money. And all of a sudden your chances go up exponentially. <laughs> the same as if you, you know, if you, if you, Put metrics into this, in, into everything that you do. Your reading time, the, your friend's time, the car that your friends borrowed. We, we, all of those are costs that can be and should be built onto the project itself. So that from the perspective of the potential funder, you're not just, in Spanish we say, morderte el reboso, like uh, bite your poncho. But rather you show up and say, well, I already have $25,000, so now I just need another twenty-five or whatever. And uh, by speaking their language, it's a, it's a really good way to do it. Another thing is to be very upfront about what it is that you want to, um, that you can offer as counterpoints. So, um, for instance, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, in Toronto, I made a project with searchlights and it cost $400,000. And all of the money was paid for by TELUS Corporation. I'm happy to tell you that. Um, and the way that we did it, the, the big negotiation is that I did not want a single logo of their work in the space. So what I did is I said, okay, how much do you spend to bring Celine Dion or whatever for your big corporate event? And it's like, whatever, 750,000, right? So what we did, so the project opened on a Friday in Toronto and Harbourfront, right? But on Thursday, before the project opened, we had a horrible corporate event where they brought this tents and ladies and whatever and drinks and their major um, sort of clients and whatever. And during that time, the project was for them and it was they felt all special and whatever. The next day, all of those tents and logos went away. And by the time that the project opened to the public, it was actually all completely clean. 
the paradoxical thing is that it costs almost the same to have a project like that for one single night than to keep it running for three weeks because the big expenses are shipping and logistics and permits and stuff like that. So, so all of a sudden, if you are so lucky as to find certain corporate clients that are willing to, to liaise with you on those terms, then, then you can do it. There's also a really important lesson, which is don't sell out um, so, you know, you, the integrity. Like, so we had BMW come, you know that shadow play? BMW said to us, oh, um, we want to do this shadow play in Frankfurt. And I said, yeah, of course, you know, we'd love to. That's great. And uh, they said, yeah, but every time that, every five minutes, we want inside of the shadows a Mini Cooper car to drive by some guy. And I just said, no, you know, like I, I could have funded the studio for a year had I accepted that. But it would backfire in ways, not just for me, for them too, like in ways that, you know, are, I, I don't even want to look at. So it's um, being very careful about picking who your partners is is, is really important. Uh, this shadow play, so that shadow play cost uh, about $350,000, okay? It was paid for by a German company called SAP, which is a software company, whatever. So here's what we did with them. We said, okay, guys, we need $350,000 to make this project. And they go like, well, you're crazy. What, what, we need logos everywhere. I said, no, you're not going to have logos anywhere. What's going to happen is at 6 p.m., we're going to shut down all the lights in the city. The projector is going to start. It's going to say, you know, Festival Ars Electronica presents, Rafael Osano Kemmer body movies, photographers are these names, credits, you know, of, of uh, programmers, whatever. And then it says, brought to you thanks to SAP. And at that moment, we show a logo that is 60 meters wide. And, uh, and they all go, oh, this is great. But it's part of the credit sequence. It, after three seconds, it disappears. And never again do you see SAP. And that's important because you have a clean cut between the work and then what actually cost or, or, or actually made it work. Um, so we've done that quite often, you know, like to, to be very upfront to what it is that you're willing to, to, uh, to offer. And then uh, the sun, for instance, um, Electra, uh, Electra Bell is a big hydroelectric um, nuclear power uh, company from Belgium. And two weeks before we were to do the solar equation project in Ghent, they came and said, Raphael, we have a, a, a request. We, we want solar equation to be called Electra Bell solar equation. And I had to pull out. I just said, oh, I'm sorry, it's not happening. And it's really super hard because you lose a lot of income, but, but it's worth it over time because you gain a certain degree of dignity and respect. All right, thank you.